along with me today, you guys. We're gonna talk about green poop, green shit, green meds, green skin, and some whiskey and brandy. Get ready. It's shamrock time. How no, brown cow. How no, brown cow. Hi, lassie. So today we're going to do a green look, obviously, since it is St. Patrick's Day and we got to actually put on some green eyeshadow with perfect day to do it. Let's start off with doing our eyes first because it's going to get everywhere. Mm. So there are a lot of actual things that can make a human body turn green, if you can believe it. Now I'm not talking about like I leprechaun green, um, but there are shades of green that the body can actually um, turn. I, <laughs> when I was looking back through some of my notes about things that turn green, there were some that I had totally forgotten about that happened years ago um, when I was an ICU nurse. So first up, we gotta talk about the green nail syndrome, okay? Green nails, and you're thinking, yeah, there's some good green nail polishes out there that are pretty awesome. Nope, not the same. We are talking about a fungus that makes your green, makes your nails turn a weird green color. And then it's, I forget what the fungus is actually called, but it's mixed with a nurse's worst nightmare for infection, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is one of the stinkiest stinkiest, stinkiest, stinkiest infections that a nurse can encounter. And um, I'm not telling like just a little bit, I'm talking, there are people out there that can smell it coming down the hallway. You can imagine that in a hospital. Just think about that for a sec. But anyway, so there's this in, uh, pseudomonas will get underneath the nail bed right here and it will actually cause um, the nails to turn this crazy green color. Hopefully I'll get a picture and I'll insert it up here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But it's it just because it's in between the nail bed and the skin, it's no good. Some issues with green pee. Can you imagine that you're sitting down doing your thing and all of a sudden you you look down and you're like, your pee, your, your pee is green. Like, my God, do, you know, what did I drink the night before? You know, that kind of panic ensues. By the way, I think I'm gonna do some Fade Into Hue today by ColourPop. This is amazing, okay? Like, if you wanna make some fabulous colorful looks out of this, and I have, so we're gonna do a little bit of that and a little bit of their smaller palette, Just My Luck, because they have a really good transition color in here that I like to fade some of my greens out that are called Chances Are. So we're gonna start with that color because that's a really good minty color. So anyway, when I mean like green, green um, pea, it's like this color or this color, maybe not with sparkles. Can you imagine having sparkles in your, your pea? I was the nurse I'd have a stroke. Anyway, so there there are some cases of of things that cause um, your urine to be green. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with what you ate or drank the night before. So don't worry about those shamrock milkshakes. I see you out there. Now this has to do with some of the fun medications and drugs that are given. Of course, we can't have like a normal side effect for everything, right? You just have nausea and, you know, bloating or whatever for like everything. No, we gotta do something weird in there like green pea. So what kind of meds, you, you ask me? Well, they have um, something called methylene blue which is used in surgery. This is the one that I, I had forgotten about, the sedative or the amnesiac as it's technically called, propofol or diprovan as its trade name is. It actually does turn your urine green on some people, not everyone's urine turns green. So which begs the question as we go down rabbit hole number one. So you're thinking propofol, yeah, that was that one drug that Michael Jackson took right before he died, right? You are correct. 
So it kind of makes me wonder, you know, did he uh, enjoy some some green urine on it? Was his urine chronically green? Did it develop after a while? This is These are things that we should know, I feel like. So now we've got a nice bruise going. Okay, this is gonna be one of those looks, people. You have to trust the process, okay? It's gonna look like a toddler has attacked my face. Trust the process. So next we're gonna take, what color are we gonna take? Oh God, did you hear that Michael Jackson impression? That was horrendous, actually. I'm gonna take this color bold type right here and we are gonna do some serious smudging and uh, blending with that color, by the way. I can't say that I ever really went to the green urine. I think it only happened like maybe a couple of times. Um, the last drug that I saw that causes a uh, green urine, one that's used by so many people everyday life, uh, and that's amitriptyline. Um, amitriptyline is used for everything from fibromyalgia to chronic headaches. It is, it's used for a lot of different things, both on label and off label. Uh, but that's some of the more popular things. Um, but apparently it turns your urine um, green, or at least some people have reported that as a side effect of that medicine. See how I said that a toddler, it's gonna look like a toddler has done my makeup? All I'm doing here is just layering, and then we're gonna blend like no other. So yeah, the other, other thing we're gonna talk about, let's talk about some green poop. Green poop, green poop. Yes, there is such a thing as green poop, and it's not just necessarily because you've had eating plants for like three weeks every single day, which I'm sure everyone can do, but no one wants to do that, or at least not me. There's, there's a couple of different types, okay? The, the fairly normal version is the frothy. That's kind of a fun word, right? Frothy. It could be a fun word. Frothy poops are the baby poops. And what happens is they're basically sucking on mama's titty. They're taken off too quickly and put on the other boob before they can get the really good stuff that's back in the back. It's like the top shelf liquor, except it's the top shelf milk. It's called the hind milk. The hind milk is the top shelf liquor. And they get switched before they can get to the top shelf. So. It's kind of like when you go to the bar and you start off with like a normal, you know, drink or two, and then all of a sudden you switch and you, you're like, you're feeling good and you go, you're like, yeah, man, let's switch to the, like the high end, you know, except imagine being rudely taken from that top shelf, rudely taken from that top shelf milk and put on another one and you had the same old milk as you had before. No good. But anyway, that's what happens. They get the frothy um, stools because they're missing out on the top shelf milk, the hind milk, and their, their poops come out kind of like a, a strange little frothy green color. Let's start off with a story. So we're gonna do um, a mixture of Mo Bamba and Act Natural. That's what I say to my son all the time, Act Natural. There was a, uh, an old legend, um, and it's from the 12th century, about two, and this happens in, in Britain, okay? 12th century, England, um, where they love their stories. They talked about how in a rural community, two, two children came out of nowhere, like came out of the woods one day, and they were both a very odd green color like completely green, not just their face, but also their hands, their legs, their feet, their whole body was a, an interesting green color. Those people were horrified. They're like, what kind of sorcery is this? You know, this is a witch kid, blah, 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 blah. You know how people are. People are mean as hell sometimes, even in the 12th century. You know, they're kids, man. They don't know why they're green. So the townspeople who got over their sorcery comment finally, when they realized the kids were not gonna eat them, took them in and you know they never found their parents. They never found out who they belonged to, where they came from, because the kids didn't know either. They started living normal lives as kids do, most children anyway. Noticed after a while that the kids' green color was fading. And then 
went away and never came back. A lot of them, they, they, they claim they have no idea, A, if this is true or not, B, what that could possibly be. Uh, stories that are handed down like that from so long ago tend to get exaggerated over the years. So like how, how green were they? You know, is my question. How green can you really be um, for them to be like, oh, that's a jaunty color you have there sir or madam my question is what if these kids actually had the starvation tinge and because there's also an interesting phenomenon called hypochromic anemia one of the rare rare things about this form of anemia is that you can um, end up having a green tinge to your skin my theory is that these kids anemic starvation mode. So think about 12th century, right? They have like, they're like meat based. They became anemic because growing kids need protein. And in 12th century, they needed meat, right? Um, to grow. And so if their bodies were used to meat and then they didn't get it because they were on the run from who knows what, maybe they had that strange form of hypochromatic anemia. Who knows? So let's talk about Irish folklore. Oh my gosh. So for my Irish friends out there, I am pretty sure you heard all kinds of fun Irish folklore over the years. Good. I'm so glad I didn't have my microphone plugged in. Oh God, I'm so good at this, you guys. So some of the Irish folklore for medicine is, is really kind of fascinating to look into. So we're gonna try this hot, 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 hot. I'm so cultured. So Irish folklore for medicine is, um, oh my God, can I get hotter? It's hot, it's hot in here. I'm dying, I'm dying of slow death, people. Okay, I know it looks crazy, but we're just gonna go with it. Guys, this is going so well. So we're gonna do a cut crease, might as well, right? I'm already screwing it up anyway. So when I do a cut crease, I just take a little bit of concealer and I put it on my hand so I can control it. And I'm just going to tap it on and make like a nice shape. I'm sure growing up that many Irish families um, had the awesome idea of telling their kids all kinds of interesting things, the different Irish remedies. Uh, one of the Irish remedies is uh, for bleeding. They are using cobwebs. Which makes sense, right? Since, you know, cobwebs are like steel basically, and they're pretty good at clotting. So whoever figured that out, good job, high five. So there's lots of other uh, particular treatments from um, Ireland that are popular. Uh, nettle, using nettles for arthritis is one. Um, and then also bilberry uh, is used as an antioxidant. Um, and you know, all of that is in like natural if you follow naturopathic medicine that's all in there as somebody who tries very very hard to practice evidence-based medicine really hard time with uh, natural medicine um, you will find practitioners who will praise natural medicine to the stars and say yes absolutely and then you will have others that are very much the skeptic so you kind of have to decide who you're gonna trust, um, you know? And I'm not saying that natural medicine doesn't work, but I, I, I do think that more studies need to happen before we really get on board with it. Uh, we think of plants as being, you know, pretty like non-harmful, but with today's medicines, you can't always say that. Um, they have, there's lots of interactions between different plants and medicines that need to be addressed. Uh, before you start dabbling. I'm gonna take my fing my winger and like tap it on. I feel like this is like a topic for another day. Because natural medicine has both really good pros and really good cons. So when we think of Ireland, we think of shamrocks. Am I right? Am I right? They use shamrocks um, as part of their natural medicines. Definitely not condoning that right now. Chat with your doctor before you start messing around with natural medicine and if you're, especially if you're on any kind of today's modern medicine. Oh, hi! Hi, kitty! He wanted to be included. He doesn't like to 
to be left out. Who does? So have you ever noticed that leprechaun, leprechauns are always like super short. Like they're almost like dwarfs in a way. So of course I had to go down that rabbit hole because why wouldn't you? Yeah, because why wouldn't you want to go down that rabbit hole? Here's something fun fact, interesting. Ireland has a huge, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> I'm funny, has a large uh, portion of their uh, population that carries the gene for gigantism. Uh, there have been numerous studies involving gigantism and the familial ge uh, gene uh, in Ireland. So that's kind of interesting that in a land that carries that gene where large families have that gene that's passed down of gig gigantic like people, the leprechaun was instead chosen to be small. <laughs> kind of different. I don't know how I feel about it. So our green's coming along, y'all. It's definitely not an Irish way to talk, is it? So there was a researcher in the 1820s who um, happened to notice uh, in Ireland that there were an unusually large amount uh, men, uh, mostly, who were extremely tall. And he traced various families, uh, kind of like your little be beginner's genetics, if you will. And he noticed that um, these particular people, they didn't have like a lot of other health problems. So their version of gigantism, um, which they have incidences of people, men only, uh, reported of up to eight, eight feet, six inches or something insane like that, which is crazy, crazy tall. But they're not the other form of gigantism, which is pituitary gigantism. That one is caused usually by a tumor it invades the pituitary glands and um, messes with your hormones um, so that you continually release growth hormone and all of a sudden you go from being like five feet tall like everybody else and then all of a sudden you're eight feet tall. It's just really unfortunate. Despite everyone's best efforts to make a leprechaun uh, be just a part of Ireland culture, it's actually uh, counterintuitive. Side note, there are some, and I will not say all, there are some uh, Irish we'll call tourist leprechauns, which I think is hilarious. God, that took forever. So we can't talk about Irish medicine without talking about one of the more famous of all of them, and that is using whiskey. Whiskey and brandy as medicinal cures. Um, and I think there is a saying about whiskey for the heart and brandy for the stomach. There actually is some science behind it. Uh, there's also been studies about how it affects your um, cardiac output, how it affects um, your blood pressure, your heart rate. A depressant, meaning, you know, it calms you down, right? Well, in, it depends on the percentage of alcohol. So when concentrated alcohol, which is like, 20 to 50% was given, um, they noticed uh, effects on the cardiac output and heart rhythm. But they, <laughs> at the same time, they also noticed that anything that was hot, so you could give like hot mustard, hot water, hot super proof alcohol, um, definitely a an irritant. Okay, I'll take that. Can you imagine taking mustard like in a liquid form and saying, yes, please. Let's see what happens to my heart. They must have guaranteed them a bottle of, you know, whiskey or something afterwards. When they tried to recreate it in like a version um, that made sense for the alcohol, they used like a diluted 0.1, 0.2%. So basically it had an effect on the vessels. Actually, <laughs> if you drink enough alcohol, it becomes kind of like a, almost like a dilator. And that's why people um, have, you know, they tend to bleed a lot when they're when they're drinking heavily. Where are my eyelashes? I have one. Eyelash, where are you? Who knows where you could be? You guys okay? God. How about we not do that again? Please don't go and lose yourself on the floor. Somebody help me. 
Help me. Help me, darling. Did that sound Irish at all? Probably not. So Brandy um, was given for a lot of different things. <laughs> Most famously, it's given for those weak creatures, those those women with weak constitutions. So back in 1907, they have a British pharmaco pharmacopoeia, which is like an encyclopedia of drugs. Um, and they were talking about brandy. It was just a form of energy. <laughs> brandy was actually given, um, not just like by mouth, as we all know it to be like drinking, um, but also IV. Okay, so wrap your brain around that. Also, it was given um, by, uh, rectally, <laughs> so up your butthole. And then also it was given as an injection, like a shot, like literally a shot of brandy. Not the COVID shot, but a brandy shot back in the old days. Oh my God. I'm just trying to imagine the conversation between the old time apothecaries and the the doctors. Yeah, just take the bottle, draw it up, and stab them. I can't even, I can't even with this next one. It was a successful resuscitation of an ectopic pregnancy gone wrong, and it was ruptured, and they gave eight and a half pints of hot saline solution mixed with brandy as an injection. Eight and a half pints as an injection, a shot, okay? I mean, I guess it's better than the alternative, a non-successful. All right, I'm gonna clean up my face and run through the rest of my makeup real quick so you guys don't have to sit through that and then we'll come back and chat some more. Okay, so back to our brandy. 
All right, we'll finish off our eyes too here. Definitely alcohol is a depressant. Okay, no, no questions about it. They in interestingly used alcohol also in um, the times of typhoid Mary, um, definitely for fevers or lowered the, your temperature um, due to the uh, vasodilation. Lashes, please stay on, at least for a little while. Fun times um, in water treatment history with typhoid Mary, um, also the, the pneumonia that people would get. So they would become really acidotic. You know, your body's got two forms um, that it likes to hang out in uh, when you're sick, and that's either going to be acidotic or base, kind of basic, which sounds terrible, but you know, it is what it is. So when you have pneumonia and you're breathing like 800 times a minute, back then, they wanted to be able to calm people down and you know get them to stop breathing so rapidly. Well, actually, the body was trying to uh, breathe off some of that acid so they breathe faster. So it's kind of like your body's way of saying, bruh, I got this. Leave me alone. I got things under control. Don't give me nothing. I got this. But they gave it to them anyway. So they would give them brandy um, and they noticed that it they had some improvement of oxygenation. Hey, it also improved delirium, but it can also cause delirium as we know. So they also decided back then during that same time, awesome, alcohol could be used as food because of its rate on metabolism. So they were just going through it, man. They were gonna decide how to make it fabulous as a product and used as food. There was a limit at which rate the alcohol could be metabolized in quantities. I'm here to tell you, there's enough sugar in alcohol that causes you to get, um, to gain weight. So, you know, maybe not the best source of nutrition though. But they also called it a medical comfort food. So like that would include things like beef extracts and soup and weird stuff like arrowroot, you know, easily digested food. So they included brandy as being a part of that one. These pharmacists slash physicians slash whoever they were, um, they also noticed that the drunks who would go and like drink like 800 milliliters of the stuff in one sitting, um, that they would fall fast asleep. So they're like, oh, okay. So it's good for sleep then too, sweet. And they especially prescribed it for old people, it says that. Um, and in cases of delirium and acute restlessness. Can you imagine what that really means to them? Like, what is acute restlessness? Is that like when you've had too much coffee, hear and see things that aren't there? I don't know about you, but my version of restlessness is uh, when I can feel my hair growing from my scalp. That's when you know I've had too much stimulant, okay? Too much coffee. One of the funniest things, and you know, as being a parent myself, I can, I get it, I get it. They would, use, they would use it as a sedative and hypnotic uh, for infants and young children. This is why if the children survived that time period with all these things we were throwing at them, hardy constitution, that's why they survived. So gradually they decided, they being medicine, decided that, you know what? This is the 1930s and the 1940s, you know? to have some issues. It's still working for obstetric emergencies. This is in the 1930s, mind you. But side note, the use of alcohol in hospitals as part of your medical treatment, um, you know, you, the nurses would come around with their trays of medicines and they would hand out the medicines to everyone. And, you know, some people got a little, you know, a little shot of whatever was their pleasure. They got a little something, something to have, um, with taking their medicines, which is insane. But I mean, that was right up until 1963 um, that people were, the hospitals were still actually, can you imagine coming around giving meds? Hello, Mr. O. Smith. Could you like your little, little shot of brandy then? Oh, see, that's more British, isn't it? So basically by the 1960s, they decided, okay, maybe not so much anymore. Maybe we should rethink this um, of using alcohol as part of the medical therapy, but that in some extended care facilities, they will actually have like a medicinal bar. They will bring people their afternoon 
cocktails, basically. The brandy or the whiskey. Shot of the old turkey. Hair of the dog. I like hair of the dog. Sounds good. I guess it would be kind of depressing. You move into an extended care facility and you can't have your cocktail hour. Would not be okay with that. Not be okay with that. We're done, you guys. We talked about so many different things. Talked about green poop and all sorts of interesting disorders that turn you green, medicines that turn you green, the whiskey, the brandy, the hair of the dog. What else could we call it? Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see you in my next video. Take care. Cheers. Oh, God. It's great. <laughs> it's you right in the, in the dog's nuts.